Good afternoon to everyone on the call, uh, to uh, Senate Majority Leader, uh, I'm sorry, House Majority Leader Matt Ritter, uh, to Senate President uh, Marty Looney, uh, to all of our elected officials, and uh, most importantly to all of the long-term care workers across the sectors of home care, uh, community programs, and nursing homes that are joining the call. Uh, you know, people know uh, that 1199 represents about uh, 20,000 long-term care workers between those three sectors, uh, and they have been on the front lines of taking care of uh, uh, residents, and consumers, and patients during the course of the last three months, and uh, uh, do doing so uh, as you know, every disparity that exists in our society uh, has been exposed in those industries. Uh, all three industries that uh, represent a those three industries represent a continuum of care uh, in terms of long-term care and care for folks with developmental disabilities. They're Medicaid-funded programs, and so uh, by definition, Medicaid, as we know, is a low-income people's program. The uh, clients and consumers and patients are disproportionately uh, poor, uh, black and brown, uh, women and disabled. Uh, and uh, sadly, those are not populations that are uh, uh, populations that have a, a tremendous amount of power in our society. And so what that meant is that as the pandemic hit, uh, we, we've had to really fight to raise up the voices of uh, the caregivers, who are the people that are uh, making sure that we are attempting to save lives uh, and to protect um, uh, all of those patients and, and residents and consumers. Uh, unfortunately, that's been an uphill fight. And uh, there are numbers that tell a part of the story. Uh, 2,700 fatalities in the skilled nursing facilities across the state. Uh, as of uh, today, uh, we've lost 12 long-term care workers uh, as a part of our union. Uh, we know that there are many other non-union workers who uh, have become sick uh, and uh, died as a result of the virus. Um, but more than the numbers, each of those people represents a, uh, a, a, a human being, a mother, a father, a daughter, a son, uh, part of a community, part of a workforce, uh, and uh, you know, uh, we, uh, it's just a, a, an incredible amount of suffering uh, that folks have had to deal with. Uh, much of that suffering, we believe, uh, you know, could have been prevented. First and foremost, had the President of the United States, Donald Trump, invoked the Defense Production Act to mass produce the personal protective equipment that would have been necessary. Uh, but there have also been, you know, failures that that are lower down the chain. And so what we're here today is, uh, to do is to uplift what we see as a long-term care workers bill of rights that would deal with the funding uh, necessary to provide the protections for both the, the, uh, the patient populations and the workforce moving forward, uh, particularly as we uh, uh, hope uh, that there will not be, but fear that there may be a resurgence uh, of the pandemic as we move towards the fall. I'll run through the 10 core points of this Long-Term Care Workers Bill of Rights. Uh, first is to increase Medicaid funding. As I said, these are all Medicaid services, all three industries. And so without adequate funding, we can't deal with questions of personal protective equipment, uh, deal with uh, uh, the, the hazard pay that workers who are exposed to extreme risk uh, deserve uh, and other needs of the workforce. Uh, second is to make sure that we ensure that there is uh, personal protective equipment available to all, all long-term care workers. Uh, many of you have seen from nursing homes or lived it, if you were a nursing home worker yourself, uh, that at the beginning of the pandemic in March and April, there simply was no personal protective equipment available for many nursing home workers. Uh, we, we shared with the public, and, and Pedro will share today, uh, the photos of workers in trash bags, um, uh, rather than real protective equipment uh, that has put residents in nursing homes at risk, that put workers at risk. It led to greater sickness and greater fatality, uh, both among the resident population and amongst caregivers. We've made some progress, but we still have many, many nursing home workers who have gone two, three, four weeks using the same masks, gloves, and gowns. That must change. Uh, and, and the accountability uh, to make sure that that takes place uh, must also be set in place. Department of Public Health uh, um, has not met the, 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 their obligation to safeguard the patients and the residents up to this point. There must be healthcare security. All uh, essential healthcare workers, all essential workers need to make sure that as they are protecting our society, being the glue to hold our society together, that they have the ability to care for themselves if they become ill, 
uh, to care for their family members if they bring the virus home to their families. Uh, and so uh, both uh, healthcare security and making sure that uh, there is compensation, uh, point four, uh, uh, premium compensation, hero pay or hazard pay, uh, so that workers are uh, available to take care of the sick uh, and compensated for the risk that they're exposed to are critical pieces. Uh, fifth, we need to make sure that there are health and safety uh, protections uh, that include truly universal paid sick leave and family and medical leave. Um, and we need to make sure that uh, uh, in, in addition that the state is providing resources to make sure that there are conf infection control measures, uh, again, particularly in the nursing homes, which truly has been the epicenter of the virus in Connecticut. Um, the one proposal that's been floated is hiring an independent uh, state employed infection control nurse for each of the state's 213 uh, skilled nursing facilities. Uh, we need support for childcare workers in all three industries, uh, primarily women, uh, many, many mothers and many uh, single parent mothers. Uh, and so available childcare, particularly as workers are dealing with uh, questions of, of overtime and um, uh, making sure that they're, they're meeting the, the staffing needs of the facility is critical. There must be protection for whistleblowers so that if there are problems in terms of uh, uh, any levels of care or availability of, of, uh, of uh, uh, personal protective equipment, whether it's in uh, group home agencies or nursing homes, we must have protection for whistleblowers um, you know, who, who uh, are able to talk about what is taking place uh, particularly in the non-union side of the industry, there is no job security for workers who blow the whistle on bosses who are making mistakes. And we know that there are serious mistakes. I would just call people's attention to uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the role that uh, the nursing facility that cared for Representative Cook's uh, father-in-law played, where they kept the fact that the virus was active in that skilled nursing facility from the workforce and from the patients for almost three weeks. Uh, eighth, we want to make sure that there are protection and expansion of collective bargaining rights. Uh, workers, again, in all three industries uh, have been doing heroic work without resources uh, in home care, for example. Uh, for the first two weeks of the pandemic, there was absolutely no communication from the Department of Social Services or Department of Developmental Services to the workforce or to the consumers. 15,000 people went with any, uh, any notification on how to safeguard themselves or their, pa their patients and consumers uh, for weeks. And so we need to make sure that we are ramping up the protections uh, for, for workers. Uh, ninth, workers need to be treated as experts, whether it's in home care, whether it's in group home agencies, whether it's in nursing homes. We cannot take the word of uh, state officials. We cannot take the word of, of uh, administrators and CEOs over the word of firsthand caregivers. In far too many instances, when direct caregivers were reporting that there was not available PPE, that they were at risk, that their family members were at risk because they may bring home the virus to them. And we know of a number of fatalities of family members, not workers, family members of workers who got sick, uh, that uh, uh, patients and residents uh, were being exposed to the virus. Uh, and again, and again, and again, there was no accountability uh, from uh, Department of Public Health in particular uh, for uh, uh, operators uh, to, to, to make sure that the, th those populations were being protected. And lastly, lastly, uh, we are in a budget crisis uh, you know, based on the economic shutdown. We're aware of that. But if Connecticut is broke on a certain level, it is broke on purpose. We are still the wealthiest state in the country. Uh, the, Disparity between the 1% making $2.5 million in annual income and the 99% making $45,000 in income is the largest in the nation. Uh, we have uh, the fifth most billionaires in the country, 17, with a collective net worth of $66 billion. Uh, we've got folks like the Candler family who have profited off of uh, tear gassing uh, populations from San Juan, Puerto Rico to Minneapolis to uh, Washington, D.C. in uh, recent months uh, who pay uh, very, very little in taxes. And so we need to make sure that we are uh, working towards a justice budget that allows for working class people, particularly uh, working class caregivers, white, black, and brown, to have the protections that they need, the same privilege that uh, the wealthiest in our state have just by virtue of waking up every day where they have the ability to live and laugh 
and love and learn and worship and breathe freely the same rights that nursing home residents, that home care consumers, that group home consumers, that the caregivers in those uh, different workforces have had to struggle for and fight for for the last four months. We should not be doing that again. And we have the resources in Connecticut uh, if we go to get them where they need to be. Uh, I'll stop now because what people really need to hear most is the voices of the caregivers themselves. Um, I'm gonna start with Gloria Duquette and, and just a word about Gloria, which I think highlights the plight of workers in this industry. Uh, Gloria has three jobs. She is a CNA at Kimberly Hall South and at St. Mary's Home. And she is also a home care PCA under the Medicaid waiver program. Gloria. Rob so we and let Gloria uh, for the end. We'll come back to her. Very good. Uh, then we'll move to Lynette Dockery, who's a PCA from Meriden, Connecticut. Good afternoon. This is Lynette Dockery. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Well, good afternoon, President. Um, my name is Lynette Dockery. I'm a PCA as well as 1199 member. I live in Meriden. Um, I've been doing this work for over 20 years. I actually started working with Ally through the waiver program about 10 years now. Um, I never felt respected with the state of Connecticut, who sets the policies on the effect of how I get paid, if I get paid, if I get PPE. Until COVID, my union was fighting for the right for us to be paid on time. How humiliating is that? The state doesn't even think that we deserve to be paid on time. When COVID hit, PCAs were not considered essential workers, but we are all essential workers. As a home care worker, we are always on the back burner. I have to beg the state for PPE. We have to spend our own money. Our consumers have to spend their money, and they don't get much from the state to protect ourselves and our families. We are putting our lives on the line every day to deliver care for our consumers. DSS don't want to validate our experiences. Hundreds of us have reported not having enough masks and gloves to work safely. But the state says we can only receive more masks and gloves if the consumer has to request them. Why isn't our own judgment and skilled and experience as a caregiver valued by the state of Connecticut? We don't have medical insurance. A lot of us don't. What do we do when we get sick? Our consumers depend on us to come in and help them live. They expect us to come in and get them ready for their lives. We are considered non-medical, but we do medical work. I come in every morning. I, with my consumer, I use at least four pairs of gloves every day. My first thing when I come in in the morning is to give my consumer her bath and to help her to get ready for her day. Next, I will have to do, my consumer has a stint in her chest. I have to flush that for her. My consumer also has a prosthetic leg, and sometimes I have to help her with her transferring. Now, when after all of that is done, getting her ready for her day, now I have to change my gloves and I have to make her breakfast. I have to get everything together for that. Now I have to change my gloves again because now the home has to be taken care of. That means I have to clean the bedroom, any laundry, the bathroom. All of these things that have to be done in the household, I still have to change and put on another pair of gloves. And before I leave my consumer for the day, I have to prepare her dinner for her to have a meal when she gets back home. My consumer goes to dialysis three times a week. And so a lot of these things have to be done. When I come in in the morning, I have to be there at seven o'clock in the morning so that she's able to get to her dialysis on time, which is very important. And PCAs are 10,000 strong. There's 90% 90, 90 of us are women. And the majority of us are black and brown women. There's a very hard time. This is very hard time for everybody. But the PCAs and our consumers, we are just trying to protect ourselves and we need help. 
And we are, and we as women of color don't have the masks and gloves we need to keep ourselves and our consumers safe. Let's just name it for what it is. This is racist policies that don't value the expertise and the livelihood of the majority of black and brown workforce. We need the state to follow on our long-term care work, bill right, bills of right, and pass the legislation that we will support the workers like me. So we are asking you today to help us and to get this bill of right passed so that those that are able to stay home and in the comfort of their home and to be taken care of, and those like me, a home care provider, we are there every day to give these people the ADL, everyday activity of daily living so that they can be prosperous and be supported in this world. So again, we're asking, can you please help us to pass this bill of rights? And thank you. Lynette, thank, thank you, thank you. And I just want to lift up a couple of things that Lynette spoke to. Uh, when we talk about the challenges that the 10,000 home care PCAs are, are facing, uh, the state of Connecticut says that there is no obligation, none whatsoever on the part of consumers to share with their PCAs if they are COVID positive. We have examples of PCAs who have become ill after caring for consumers who did not tell them that they had COVID-19, number one. Number two, 60% of the folks that we've spoken to as PCAs anecdotally have told us that they have received no PPE from the state of Connecticut, 60%. So, you know, when we talk about critical needs facing a workforce, you know, I can't think of anything more critical than those two points. Lynette said it more powerfully than I can. Uh, this is a workforce that is low income, majority black, majority brown. It is unimaginable to me that whether it's home care PCAs, whether it's nursing home workers, whether it's group home workers, that a population that was not that demographic would be treated in this way, would be treated as if their risk, as if their exposure, as if their suffering, and as if their potential, and in some cases, literal deaths do not matter. And there needs to be change. I see that uh, Gloria has joined us. Gloria, are you on? Gloria Duquette? Yes, I'm on, finally. Okay, Gloria, please, please say some words. Thank you for joining us. I know you had to, to rush to get here. Okay. Please say some words yes. about, the, uh, just to add nursing home workers voice uh, to, to the conversation. Okay, I'm sorry I'm late, guys. Um, I'm a good afternoon to you all. My name is Gloria Duquette and I'm a CNA. I'm a member of of the District 1199. I currently live and work in the Hartford area. Um, I work three jobs to take care of my family. I am here to urge the legislator and the governor to pass policies on this bill of rights so that workers like me are protected and compensated like the professionals we are. I currently make $15 and 25 cents an hour on one job and 14.95 on another job. That barely enough to survive. Many of my coworkers work multiple jobs like me. We spend our time running from one job to the next. Even when we're tired, sometimes we're working so many jobs means we can't even take a vacation or if we try to, we are too tired to actually enjoy the time we spend. We spend our family. We spend time fighting to breed in our community. We Gloria, just went on mute. Could you unmute yourself? Gloria, you just muted yourself. Could you unmute? Gloria, could you unmute? I had to go back to work after 10 years because I had to pay bills. But I ended up getting my husband sick. He lost the money because he had to be out of work. And he never would have gotten sick if it wasn't for me bringing, bringing it home to him. But I have to work to survive. Some of my coworkers have been sick and brought it home to their family members. I even had a coworker who gave it to her mother. And her mother died. We had to start to go fund to pay for, the fun for her funeral expenses. 
we don't know what is going to happen to this virus and we are begging DPH and nursing homes we work for to protect the people who are sick. For the first two months of this pandemic, we weren't given PPE and we were insulted, disrespected by us administrators. One administrator told me, I don't know the symptom because I'm not a doctor. I am just a lonely aide, but, I, but I'm the one who makes money for them. This treatment made me feel worthless and inhumane. I am caring for other people's family and no one cares about me or my family. No one mentioned the aides that do the hard jobs. Everyone talks about the doctors and the nurses, but no one talks about the aides. The people on the top make all the money. We make nothing. We don't want to hear to hear that we don't want to hear we thank you and we are the backbone. We want to be paid and want to be treated as important as we are being told we are. We have to hold these corporations responsible and long-term care workers like me needed to be given the respect we deserve and paid like the expert that we are. Thank you. When Gloria, th thank you. When, when Gloria talks about the challenges that nursing home workers in particular have faced, again, time and again, in real time, we forwarded photos of workers in trash bags at facility after facility up until the beginning of May, the beginning of the month of May, to Department of Public Health, which is charged with the responsibility of safeguarding nursing home residents, and nursing home workers. And we all know just the basic understanding that we cannot protect our patients if we are at risk of catching the virus ourselves and spreading it to some of the other residents. Gloria talks about some of the tragedies that have befallen the workforce and the residents at Kimberly Hall. Gloria is at Kimberly Hall South, her sister building 30 yards away, Kimberly Hall North, over 40 resident fatalities, Kumari Roach in the dietary department in that building lost her life due to the virus. Francine, a nurse's aide in the North building, brought the virus home to her mother. Francine has been out since March 15th, not returned to work. Francine's mother lost her life on May 1st. The workers on this call They, they knew what they were going into. They understood the risks that they were taking. Take your time, Rob, take your time. What they did not agree to do was to be treated as if their lives did not matter. There is no fundamental difference. Whether you cannot breathe, because the police officer is choking you out on the street, or whether you cannot breathe because your employer and the state of Connecticut left you in trash bags for months, and I'm tired, much less me. The workers on this call are tired of being told that they have what they need. We know the truth. The truth is in the photographs. The truth is in the fatalities. The truth is in the workers who lost their lives. The truth is in the workers' mothers who lost their lives. And we have officials like Barbara Cass from Department of Public Health, who in the beginning of May, the same day that we were sending her photos of workers in trash bags says, there's no problem with availability of personal protective equipment in nursing homes. If they're wearing trash bags, it's by choice. I've said it. And I'm going to say it again, the most boldly racist statement I have ever heard 
from a state official in the state of Connecticut. The workers are not trash. Their residents are not trash. But they found out what it was like to be treated like trash on that day. Workers understand what it is to show up and to make sacrifices and to give when they feel like they've got nothing left to give because they love the vocation of caring for people. But for 13, 14, and $15 an hour, nobody agreed to this. We're gonna move to Greg Todd, who's the depart, uh, direct support professional from Sunrise Northeast. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, and uh, good afternoon to everybody that's on the call at this time. Um, I'm gonna try my best to relay a message from the workers at Sunrise Northeast here in Connecticut. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to say that our prayers and our well wishes goes out to all the families affected by this pandemic in whatever way that you may have been affected. We care for you. And so we feel your pain. So our prayers and well wishes go out. I'm an employee at Sunrise Northeast, which is a group home agency where I take care of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I've been in the field of this work for over a decade. The staff at Sunrise are incredible and have been very dedicated during this pandemic, showing up continuously day in and day out. We workers have been selfless in our goal of providing the utmost care for our consumers. In some cases, we have put ourselves in harm's way on a regular basis so that the agency can maintain the reputation that it holds in this field. We workers are at the same time exposed to the community when we go shopping and taking our clients to necessary appointments while the pandemic is still ongoing. While we are committed to providing the best care for our clients during this time, we workers also have needs. This pandemic has caused financial hardship for many, and as essential workers, we do not have the luxury of working from home. Many private sector groups, many private sector group home companies have provided ongoing incentive pay for their workers, as well as additional sick leave for COVID related reasons, which has really helped those staff during this difficult time. However, at Sunrise, we have had to continually fight to receive some form of incentive pay. And what we are getting right now is much less than other workers have received. Our company is also the only unionized agency that is flat out refusing to provide their employees with additional sick leave during this time. I cannot even express how upsetting this is for all of us staff to know that we are being treated as less than our fellow workers across the state. To make matters worse, many of us do not even have health insurance as the premium rates at our company are outrageous. To give you an idea of what it would cost to provide insurance for your family during this pandemic, if you are a Sunrise worker, you would have to pay more than $4,200 a month to get your family on a plan. This is impossible to afford. As a result, many of us are scared that if we get sick, not only will we not receive any additional time off, we will not be able to afford the health care that it would take to get well. We want to know why this is okay. Why in the worst pandemic many, many of us have lived through, does any company think it is okay to treat their workers like this? Why are we not important enough to have these basic needs met? COVID leave, fair incentive pay, insurance coverage, and fair wages. We are working class Black, 
brown, and white workers who deserve more respect and dignity during this time. We take care of the clients at sunrise. We also need to be able to care for ourselves and our families during this time. We are calling on Sunrise Northeast to do the right thing and provide COVID leave, fair incentive pay, and affordable health insurance during this pandemic. What I've just shared with you was a release that was written because I am an emotional guy. And just as Rob was struggling, I struggled with my communication between an agency that treats me like I really don't exist until they want to get accolades. I told Sunrise Management that I'm tired of hearing how it feels when you tell me I'm doing a good job. I want you to show me that you really care about the work that I do, that you really care about my health and my condition so that when I go home, that I'm as healthy as I was when I left home. We, we need COVID leave and we need incentive pay because I know this for a fact. When I show up at work and I'm comfortable with what's going on in my life, my performance is better. Greg, you just muted yourself, brother. You gotta unmute. Greg, you gotta un, there you go. Thank you for allowing me to share that. Thank you, Greg. Um, we, we are aware, of course, that uh, today the Bipartisan Women's Commission called for uh, some investigation uh, and, and spoke to the RFP that is put out for the, uh, for, for the investigation into specifically nursing homes. That deals with one of these three industries. Uh, and we, of course, support efforts to, to uh, do a thorough investigation to where there were breakdowns that led to the tragic uh, you know, uh, number of loss of life in nursing homes amongst both staff uh, and, uh, and, of course, uh, residents. Um, again, we, we, we need to make sure that uh, in, in addition to just investigation that on a go forward basis that we are upholding uh, the rights of the workforce uh, who are the most, uh, I would say, powerful advocates that the, the uh, residents in nursing homes, that the consumers in home care and that the consumers in group homes have. Um, to speak to uh, any of the issues that came up, we're gonna have some of our elected leadership uh, say a few words. We're gonna start with Senate President Marty Looney. Senator Looney, if you uh, go to the bottom yep. left, here, there you are. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yes, I attended that uh, uh, press conference uh, this morning with a bipartisan uh, group of uh, women legislators that speak about the nursing home crisis. And uh, the governor has announced that he is uh, setting up a, a task force, but that he is uh, going to have a, uh, a consultant hired uh, to do that. The RFP is out, but has not yet been uh, that person, that entity has not yet been selected. Our concern is that this needs to be done uh, sooner rather than later. We have to move quickly on, on these issues because we have to be ready for the second wave of the pandemic that is predicted. And we need to be in, in a better position three months from now than we were three months ago uh, in being ready for the second wave of the pandemic if it is gonna be as heavily focused upon the elderly, especially the frail elderly in nursing homes uh, and placing at risk uh, the workers who work not only in nursing homes, but in group homes, as you said, and also the personal care attendants who are working for uh, private clients in, in private homes. So um, I fully endorse the 10-point uh, the list of programs that, uh, that you listed here today. And I think it's, uh, it's critically important for us also, uh, I think it's, it's implied in, in this list also, is that there be a presumption created in terms of workers' compensation availability that when a worker in any of these three uh, categories uh, acquires the illness, that that be presumed to be work-related. Uh, the burden should not be on the worker to prove to prove that. It should be uh, it should be a presumption in the worker's favor that uh, anyone who works in the in this field in those three contexts should uh, that person contract the, the the disease. It should be presumed to be work-related and not be a contested issue uh, for workers' compensation. 
Um, and we need to, to look at, uh, at best practices. We know that some nursing homes have had a very low rate of infection. Uh, others a very high rate of infection. Um, 64% of the overall deaths that we have seen from uh, the virus have occurred in nursing home patients and uh, to some extent also those who are in assisted living facilities. But uh, we know that it's taken a great toll on the patients, but also, uh, as was said here and documented, the very brave and courageous workers uh, who care for, uh, for these patients every day, these frail people, um, and themselves know every day when they're going to work, they're going into a situation where they may be putting themselves at risk. And uh, at least at the beginning of the crisis, we know that they did so without the equipment that they needed to make themselves safe on a daily basis. And uh, I'm fully committed to work closely with 1199 uh, and all other entities who are interested in worker safety and worker protection to uh, implement the program you listed here, along with that uh, creation of a presumption in favor of workers' coverage. Senator Looney, thank you so much for your support on, on both the 10 points laid out here, the, the Long-Term Care Workers' Bill of Rights and the presumptive workers' comp issue. Uh, we have workers who are going through the absolute absurdity. It, it seems like it's something from, you know, from, from a science fiction movie or from a satire where you know, 50, 80, 100% of the work for, of, the, of the residents, uh, in some cases a quarter of the workforce in their facility uh, is sick with COVID-19. They file their workers comp claim, which would deal with their out-of-pocket medical expenses, which for many of the workers, probably most of the workers on this call uh, can possibly run into the tens of thousands of dollars due to the fact that they have bad health coverage. And then their comp claims are denied. How can you prove that you got COVID-19 at your facility where 80, 100% of the work of the resident population is sick? So we appreciate your advocacy on that issue. Uh, moving to um, uh, Representative Ritter, the majority leader in the House. Thank you, Mr. President. Rob, can you hear me okay? We can. Um, and, and Marty, thank you, Mr. Senate President, for, for your words beforehand. And you're not going to hear a lot of or any disagreement or any space between us on these issues. I really want to, on a personal note, thank the, the folks uh, who share their personal stories. Um, I can assure you that uh, your president and others relay these to us. And I've been on a call a few weeks ago. But whether you hear them for the first time or the second time or the tenth time, um, they don't get any less emotional or any less difficult for decision makers to hear these stories. And one of, one of the, the, the speeches I heard this afternoon was, thank you is great, but as the Senate President talked about, there's actions that have to follow uh, to demonstrate that you really are saying thank you with appreciation and gratitude versus saying it just to say it. Um, we will have your back. You will have our support as you have on previous issues. Uh, and for me, it's just uh, a reminder of the work you do every day and how special um, you are and your relationships are with your patients. You know, Brandon McGee, some of you know Representative McGee very well. He's a dear friend of mine. We represent Hartford together. He lost his grandmother at Kimberly Hall in Windsor. Uh, we lost the head of our legislative management staff at Kimberly Hall in Windsor. So we've actually, we, we know, we've had many members lose folks and we know that but for your care and your expertise, we may have lost a lot more in the state. So as we go through what I pray is not an awful second wave and what I hope is um, some normalcy with, with either uh, increases in science and, and, and other things that may hopefully prevent some of the 4,000 deaths uh, we've seen in Connecticut already, um, we do have your back. And so our thank you, I think as Marty said, is not being on calls and just listening. You, we will back it up with our actions and just know that I pray for you every day and for your families. Um, I don't have any loved ones in nursing homes. I lost my grandparents um, before all this happened, but I do know when they were there, when they needed care, they needed care at home. Um, it was individuals like yourself, 1199 members that cared for them. And our family has always been particularly grateful for that. So we love you and we care about you and we do have your back. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Representative Ritter. Uh, we also are honored to be joined by uh, Majority Senate Leader Bob Duff. Uh, Senator Duff, uh, we're, you're welcome to say any words. Great, thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you everybody for uh, what you shared with us. I just wanna also align myself with the words of Senator Looney and uh, Representative Ritter as well. Um, but my message 
and, and everything they said was absolutely right. So I definitely want to echo and uh, align myself with what they have to say. Um, I think what is important from today's conversation outside of supporting the 10 points that you raised today is that I hope that the broader public um, really lets the words that we heard today from the workers, your members sink in. Um, these are truly uh, stories that um, are so impactful, uh, so strong, and uh, people out in the public need to understand the sacrifices that have been made by uh, the workers uh, during this crisis. Um, these are very difficult times. Uh, as was said, people have not only put themselves at risk uh, to help others, they have put their families at risk too. Um, and as we deal with systemic racial issues uh, in the legislature and outside the legislature, um, we have to continue to make sure that we are um, looking at uh, and acting upon these types of issues because we'll, we'll never move ourselves forward if we are not um, actively looking to address uh, issues like the ones at nursing homes. Uh, and it's been far too long. It's been uh, decade after decade after decade. Um, so you have all of our commitment to do what we need to do, but I, uh, and we're all to a certain extent uh, preaching to the convoluted. I know we have some press on here as well. Um, but I would just hope again, that uh, we can get that message across to the public. Uh, that uh, about the sacrifices that have been made and, and the working conditions people have had to work through and the ways in which um, folks have rallied around to care for the most vulnerable in our population. So again, thank you for inviting me and to say a few words. Uh, thanks for all the good work that you do each and every day to protect those in nursing homes. Senator Duff, uh, thank you. And I just want to hold up that uh, while, while the problems in nursing homes are absolutely the most acute, uh, g given the, the, the scale of uh, illness and fatality that we've seen amongst both uh, uh, residents and workers. Uh, we, we are very much thinking in terms of the continuum of care uh, because the elderly right. population is going to be moving back and forth between home care and skilled nursing. Uh, folks with developmental disabilities will be moving again back and forth between group home, congregate settings, and home care. Uh, and the, the challenges that the uh, Medicaid workforce uh, Medicaid funded workforce uh, faces is quite parallel. So uh, we, we are very much pushing on the idea of making sure that we are addressing the concerns of all three sectors um, and, and uh, 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 making sure that we, we don't miss the opportunity to uh, protect, again, both the patient and workforce population. We'll open it for any questions that folks may have. Members of the media. Can you hear me, Rob? Yeah, Frank. Uh, yeah, Frank Lally, uh, Robin and Radio. Rob, what do you think your role will be in this inquiry? Are you gonna be a part of the group setting the parameters for it? And will you be there step-by-step step, or will you be on the outside? There has been no outreach to us uh, as of yet on the question of the inquiry. Uh, we are, of course, um, uh, insisting that the frontline caregivers, uh, the people who provide the hands-on care, the people who are there to see the crisis, the illness, the suffering, the people who have no financial interest in protecting bottom lines over human lives, that their voices be valued. We are here talking about these issues because they've been treated as if they're invisible by the Department of Public Health and by others. That is why we are here. And I believe that if the state had done a more aggressive job in making sure that there was accountability not in June, not in May, not in April, but in March, which is when we began to report on the catastrophe that was taking place in some of the skilled nursing facil facilities in particular, when we began through the Medicaid waiver program in our dialogue with DSS to say that a day, 
then five days, then 10 days, almost two weeks went by before a single word of communication went out to 15,000 people between the consumers and the workforce. Had those things taken place months ago, there would be people who would be with us today that are not with us. Do we have any other questions from the media for uh, Rob, the workers, or our, our elected officials? Um, yeah, I, I have one. Um, it's it's sort of a combination. What what do you think led to this inquiry ultimately, and um, what what would you like to see come out of it in terms of accountability? I mean, I, I think first and foremost, what led to the inquiry was the fact that we've had an apocalyptic level of suffering and fatality in skilled nursing facilities. Okay, I mean, there are facilities where 40, 50, in some cases 70 residents have died. There are dozens of workers who have lost their lives in these facilities. And so that, that first and foremost, but I'll, I'll be quite blunt and say that if the workers on this call hadn't been heroic enough to raise holy hell from one end of the state to another, I don't think it would have mattered. Just like people have been losing their lives to police officers and until people started to pull out their cell phones, nobody believed that there was a problem with cops shooting black people. Well, in this case, nobody's getting shot, okay? What we're talking about is workers and residents who because of their position as low-income people caring for a poor population majority women, majority black, majority brown, remainder working class white, their words, their input, their hands-on experience was not valued. It was not treated as credible. There is no other explanation. We have the Department of Public Health guardian of the nursing home resident population and workforce, Barbara Cass, who says, as we are putting out photos in real time of workers in trash bags, that there's enough personal protective equipment and that they're wearing it by preference. She still has a job. We've been fighting back and forth with the PCA Workforce Council for months. They care for 5,000 people, many of whom have multiple PCAs, and we cannot get the PCA Workforce Council to make a declarative statement or the Department of Social Services that those consumers have an obligation to relay to their workers if they are COVID positive. This is the reality that people are dealing with. So when we talk about a Bill of Rights, you know, we needed a Bill of Rights in this country 200 years ago to safeguard the most basic freedoms that people in the new nation needed to have, okay? Don't take us figuratively, take us literally. This is what the workers and the residents need to protect themselves. Hi, Ron, my name is Clarence Stewart. Can you hear me? Um, I'm quite, I'm not, on, I don't understand something here. If my client is uh, infected, but I have no idea that he is and the government or the state won't tell me and somehow I get infected, I have no recourse whatsoever as, as of now to somehow uh, to compensate me for the illness that I received from my client or I can't even prove that. Is that, does that sound about right? Clarence, you're, you're a PCA under the Medicaid waiver program? Yes. yes? Okay. That, 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 that is the situation as it currently stands. So there's nothing- what you, what you just stated, those are facts. 
So there's really nothing I can do unless some type of law has been passed. And that's what we're trying to do right now. Am I correct? Brother, that's why we got a movement, okay? Not every tragedy creates a movement, but every movement comes from tragedy, okay? Just like we had to see Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd before people started to stand up, okay? Sadly, what we've had to see is a whole lot of suffering, okay? And best believe we're gonna stand up. There needs to be change here. Now, see, I'm the type of person, if I see a problem, I would try, instead of, I'm not saying we complaining or you're complaining, I try to look past that and try to solve the problem so where everybody get some type of help. Um, what are we doing right now to uh, solve this problem? Yeah, we, we should talk some more offline because this is what we're doing right now in addition okay. to a whole lot of other stuff. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the media who have questions uh, for Rob, uh, for elected officials or for the workers? Hey, Rob. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Dave Altamari from The Current. Um, where do we stand on uh, the testing of all long-term care facility employees? Um, it, it seemed like there was some delay in starting that. And where, where are we at with that? Do you have any idea? Are, are all of them been tested, half of them? So, uh, no, the testing is improving. Uh, th there was a report which, frankly, we've got some concerns about that all nursing home uh, 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 workforce had been tested. Uh, we, we, we do not believe that we've gotten to the point where we have 100% testing or anywhere near it. Uh, there's a couple of other issues, which is that while the state is paying for testing uh, through uh, July 14th, after that point in time, uh, it's then rolling on to the, the payroll of the workforce. We're concerned that that may be passed off on the workers themselves. That's one particular concern. Uh, and this is a low income workforce. Uh, the other piece is that, you know, again, there are facilities where you've got just dozens of staff uh, that have been exposed to the virus. So uh, there's a necessary uh, uh, quarantine period, as we all know, of about two weeks uh, of so somebody being non symptomatic. Uh, or, or uh, since their last positive test before they can return. So as we head particularly into uh, the fall, if there's a resurgence, how are we gonna make sure that we've got adequate staffing when you may have potentially dozens of workers who are then quarantined? Uh, and you know, uh, I, I don't think that $2 hazard pay, which is about what we've been able to achieve in some places or time and a half at best uh, is gonna be sufficient when folks know that they're coming into an environment where there's a virus that may result in the loss of their life, or even worse, the loss of lives of people in their own families. And there is no testing whatsoever uh, that is taking place to our knowledge uh, in terms of comprehensive testing uh, in uh, community programs. And we know for a fact that there is not an effort to comprehensively test the home care uh, workforce. Any other questions uh, from the media for Rob, our elected officials, or um, the workers? We'll give you a few seconds to unmute yourself. Yeah, Rob. Uh, can, I've been looking at, so, uh, as best I can, because it's, it's not easy to do, I've been looking at these citations for the nursing homes, uh, real breakdowns in, in infection control uh, shocking in some details, at least to me. And then I see the fines, 5,000 bucks, 10,000 bucks. Um, what's your, do you have any comment about that? I mean, I think a total fines on the nursing homes, I think is only about 28, uh, $28,000. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, Frank, it, it, it boggles the mind. I, I mean, again, uh, 2,700 fatalities, and uh, to, to uh, our understanding that there are a handful of facilities, you think about 22 at this point that have been fined, um, you know, but, but, but when you talk about the, 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 the minimal amounts uh, that the facilities have been fined, it's not going to deter anybody from doing anything. 
So I mean, we, we've been calling for the question of, of accountability for nursing home operators, again, from day one in the pandemic, from day one. Uh, and, and, and nobody has been able to adequately explain to us how we have somebody who publicly in the beginning of May said that there was no problem with personal protective equipment when people were wearing trash bags, why that person is still in that role. You know, your proposal around hiring a, an infection control nurse in each of the nursing homes we think is a great one and it's not a big ticket expense. We're talking about a couple of million dollars that could go a long way towards saving lives, preventing suffering. So, you know, the, 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 there is, you know, uh, the, the pandemic, the existence of the pandemic is an act of nature, but there are human decisions in terms of resourcing the facilities and creating accountability, which will result in meaningful improvements to people's lives that would save lives. Just one more example I'll give of, of, of just, you know, incredible breakdown. Again, you know, uh, early May, uh, you know, a, 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 uh, the, uh, a Stone Academy, uh, or I don't remember if it was Stone Academy or Porter and Chester. Stone Academy, Jesse? Yeah, Stone Academy uh, training class comes in to uh, Riverside in East Hartford and none of the staff is given personal protective equipment. That's a facility that has had dozens and dozens and dozens of fatalities. Show up at the nursing home, no protective equipment for a, a nurse training class. To our knowledge, no action taken. Any other questions? Hey, it's it's 3.30. We had planned until 3.30. Uh, if there's any questions from the media, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Uh, meanwhile, let me remind you, I've sent you all uh, the document that we will be looking at to evaluate uh, the new legislation to protect these brave workers and the people they care for every day. If any members of the media want to uh, go in depth one-on-one uh, -on -one with Rob or with one of uh, the brave members, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. And I will be providing a full uh, recording of this video as soon as I can process it. Uh, and I'll send it uh, to all the media on my list uh, as soon as possible. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, what about racism in your job? You're talking about your job as a caregiver? Uh, yeah, I um, recently had to quit my job um, because of the verbal abuse and the racism. Um, and what, 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 what sector are you in, sister? I'm sorry for your-, your um, your Allied, I work for Allied with a patient at home. Um, and there was multiple different racial comments that was said around me. And it was more that they were taking advantage of me more than anything. And they were making me do things that I wasn't supposed to be doing. Yep. I had to move her entire house and to her mother's. And then I had to move her back. Um, and I did it out of the kindness of my heart, but then it turned to a whole nother thing. I would probably have to go more in depth and probably talk to you one on one because it's really long um, to stay okay. over this. So I will probably contact you guys and talk to you um, specifically about it. But in result, I couldn't take it anymore. Um, it was affecting me at home. My daughter was realizing it. My family was realizing it. I had to get a therapist. Started getting sick. 
it was just too much for me. So I would probably have to talk to you individually. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry for your pain and your experience. Uh, I want you to talk to uh, Deidre Merch and whoever your organizer is on this call um, so that we can file because we are doing work. It's very difficult amongst the PCA workforce because folks are isolated and the consumer is the employer. Uh, but we are putting together work around uh, discrimination and harassment that is really important to connect you to. So uh, I'd like you to talk to your organizer and to Deidre Merch. Thank you everybody once again uh, for joining us in today's praise conference. Please uh, check your inbox uh, for uh, the recording of this video. Again, if you have any further questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, uh, senators and representatives and, and all the 1199 staff and BRAVE members. Uh, we will have uh, another uh, event on Thursday at uh, Bushnell Park uh, to remember the brave uh, work of all these uh, members and, um, and all the tragedy that we've seen in Connecticut due to COVID. Thank you very much.